Hi everyone, this is Emily Clark filling in for Liz Tran at Quavi. I want to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar on hill slope hydrology and earth systems models. I'd like to remind you that we will try to have a discussion after the presentation, so if you're able to connect over the phone, go ahead and do that. Um, you'll have a better audio connection and then we'll try to take some questions over the phone lines after the presentations. Um, if you do connect over the phone or through your speakers, I just remind you to mute yourself so that we don't get background noise. Um, otherwise, you can raise your hand. You can use the raise your hand feature on your toolbar if you have a question, or type a question into the question box and we will read it aloud. Um, so with that, I would like to turn things over to Ying Fan for today's introduction. So Ying, are you, you there? Uh, yes, yeah. thank you, Emily. Can you see my screen? I, we can't yet, but I can send you screen sharing. Hang on one moment. Okay, so I just, just sent you the presenting request. Okay, all right. There we go. Now I see it. Okay. So now let me, uh, I have all the, oh, just that, what happened? I have, I have a lot of stuff on my screen, right? Um, <laughs> let me, let me uh, go do the slideshow. Uh, there you go. Can, can you see, but I still have all the, all the control panel on my screen. I don't, we Do don't you see, see that it. as well. Okay, great. Nope. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, sorry to repeat this intro again, uh, but first time attenders, I think it's good to give uh, them the concept. And uh, this is a uh, uh, NSF Inspire project, a collaboration between Kwasi and NCAR to, um, to engage the hydrologists, particularly hill slope and catchment hydrologists to help improve the process present uh, representations in the earth system models in the large model grid. And on the lower uh, right oh. lower right panel, this is a slide I borrowed from level <sighs> four to talking later today. So on the lower right panel uh, is a schematic of those large model grids uh, divided tiles. Those grids are on the order of one degree at least by one degree uh, or 100k by 100k uh, meters. And uh, so the, the grid is divided by uh, tiles and of different land cover and land type uh, with a dozen plant functional types in the natural uh, landscape. Uh, but the grid has only one elevation. Uh, that is, there are no hills and valleys, no topographic relief, no hill slope hydrology. And on the left hand side, the lower left hand side, the figure uh, schematically shows that with land topography, uh, we will have elevation differences or we'll have aspect differences. And these are uh, critically important in determining lateral convergence of a hill slope. Uh, moisture and as well as aspect differences in a uh, sunshade and uh, sun, sun slope and the shady slope energy balances. So these are just examples of some of the hydrologic common sense that we hydrologists know very well and we know how this works and we can uh, probably, re we're ready to put those in uh, earth system models. And so um, we organized five um, web webinars to discuss those issues, asking those questions. And uh, um, at the end of the uh, seminar series, we hope to write up a synthesis paper to um, provide some uh, recommendations and guidances for Earth system model developers and how to capture the essence of hill slope hydrology. And uh, um, next slide, we have uh, two weeks ago our first seminar and led by Elham and Andreas asking the question, where in the world is hill slope hydrology important to ET and over a large model grid? And then the idea there is to really think global, which is not something we're accustomed to as catchment hill slope hydrologists, but we, we really need to step out and ask this question, where 
in the world, in what kind of hydrologic environment that hill slope hydrology is really important in getting the grid mean fluxes exchanged with the atmosphere right. And so on the second uh, webinar a week ago, we um, asked this question, suppose uh, we know where it is important, and then how do we really do it? We can't um, represent every individual hill slope. Uh, we can't represent the, the, the great deal of complexity we would like to uh, for computational reasons. And so uh, the question is, how can we boil down the hydrological processes in those model grids into uh, some kind of representative elements? And so these are the questions that we're asking last webinar and this webinar. That is, what are the basic subgrid units? Uh, how does water move through each, and how are they connected to the surface waters? Last week, we had Peter and Huri uh, sharing their thoughts with us. And today, we uh, welcome John and uh, Leho. I hope Leho will get, on, will get on soon. He is somewhere in Chile in the airport. I um, hope he will get, join us soon. And uh, the uh, end product or the goal we're shooting for is some practical uh, approaches, probably multiple approaches. Okay, with that, I'm going to pass this to John. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. You sound good. And we can see your screen. All right. Well, I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for organizing this project, and I'm happy to be part of it. Um, I'm going to start off with, uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, a simple hill slope model um, that I've been working on. Uh, just a brief uh, background of our goals of the project as I see it. Um, essentially, we're trying to simulate lateral water transfer in Earth system model grid cells, which will hopefully improve the accuracy of the uh, water budget over the grid cells, um, where lateral flow is important for distributing uh, water, surface water, groundwater, soil water. Uh, the method should be viable in the climates and ecology uh, communities and geological landscapes that we find over the whole Earth, over any grid cell. Uh, it should require minimal data. For example, just a digital elevation model would be some data we have globally. We have others. Uh, the, flame, the framework uh, of the hill slope model should be able to accommodate the existing structure that we find in Earth system models, hopefully, and be improved upon without too much uh, work. And last, it should uh, require minimal computational expense. So the framework that I'm looking at here is essentially dividing up uh, the grid cell uh, into elevation-defined uh, uh, areas, moving longitudinally upslope from a uh, regional river model or groundwater uh, model, and the, and dividing up the hill slope into essentially uh, rectangular columns, <coughs> where the columns are representing uh, area, fractional area of the grid cell between different elevation bands, and then uh, uh, representing different physical uh, properties in each column that are rep uh, corresponding with the uh, land fraction over those elevation bands, and also connecting them hydro hydrologically to each other going down slope. So the big challenge uh, for this approach is how do we um, decide how many of these columns or units there will be, at where they will uh, be delineated in the what I call the longitudinal uh, direction, which is moving up slope, and um, what are the other dimensions of, the, of each column that would represent the uh, connectivity between the columns. So these are the longitudinal locations, which would also determine how many columns there are moving up slope. Uh, the, the longitudinal column widths essentially are could be thought of as the orthogonal distance between the elevation contours that define the column areas. And then finally, the cross-sectional widths of the columns, which would allow for divergent and convergent flow between columns. So 
one approach that I uh, have been spending a little time on, it's a very simple idea, um, would be to, to determine where the column interfaces are using the hypsometric curve of the grid cells. And on these plots, the dotted vertical lines are showing um, elevations where uh, we could have a, a, a interface between columns. And it's simply just looking at where the curvature of the hypsometric curve is high. If we look at the north central Ohio uh, hypsometric curve, we can see there's a, a steeper gradient in the, uh, at higher, some of the higher elevations and at the lowest elevations, which might be causing a wetland area. Whereas in the Great Basin, uh, we have high mountain ranges that taper off into long valleys where most of the hydrologic activity is happening up at the high altitudes on alpine, subalpine zones, and that's why we have more columns at the uh, higher elevations. And there's also a lot of other op uh, options for discretizing the uh, a grid uh, cell based on topography, topographic index, uh, drainage density, perhaps ecotones or geologic or soil properties. Now once we have these interface locations, um, the way I would go about, one way to go about defining these column dimensions uh, is shown here. So the longitudinal width of each column I'm calling A is approximated by the average orthogonal distance between contours, which were defined in the previous slide. So it, that that's a simple calculation using the area between contours and summing up the lengths of the two contours that define a zone. That's a rough estimate of the average orthogonal distance. And then from, um, since we already know the fractional area of each elevation uh, band, we can get the cross-sectional width, B. The result of breaking up the hill slope by elevation bands can be thought of as defining areas that you could think of as eco-climatic zones or zone, you know, elevation respond, uh, corresponds with climate typically, um, although to varying, uh, in varying ways across the world, but, uh, and to ecology and sometimes geology and soil. Um, so this is an example of, the, of a Great Basin mountain range where you have an alpine tundra system at high elevations producing a disproportionate amount of runoff and lateral flow, and, and then also a high amount of ET in the mid-altitude uh, mid zones in these mountain ranges that might be underestimated in the grid cell. And then going on to vertical discretization of these columns, um, by breaking up the hill slope into columns, we could easily vary the, uh, if we have information like soil texture variations with depth in the different elevation bands, we could vary the number of layers. We could also vary the depth. And the, the, the depth of the column uh, would be important to, as it relates to bedrock, uh, depth to bedrock. Um, we have mountain ranges just uh, in the Great Basin, for example, again, where there's igneous intrusions, granite intrusions that may cause a lot of spring discharge, um, increasing the runoff that might be underestimated, and soil moisture at the mid uh, mid altitudes, um, and uh, affecting how much lateral flow is moving to recharge in the valleys. And we could do this by just simply changing the depth of soil columns that. Uh, correspond with the elevation bands where this occurs. Of course, if we're doing one hill slope, uh, that might not be doable. We may have to use multiple. Um, a little bit on hydrologic computations in this model. Um, we would need, we would want to include some type of channel routing, channel flow in the columns themselves and couple them to a regional river model. Um, we could use simple parameterizations uh, that were like a uh, contributing area of how much runoff would overland flow would contribute to stream flow, how much would contribute to lateral flow to the downslope column, um, and 
<laughs> and we could use topographic indexes, ho hopeful or topographic, sorry, metrics to understand how, if we do not have the data, how 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 much of a stream channel routing system is in the, the columns. Uh, for surface water and groundwater flow, we have using this approach, we can use the average width, cross-sectional widths between columns uh, hint, uh, to compute the, the flow. Um, I'm Manning's equation and Darcy's law are two options. Um, we could also use the, uh, in these cases, we'd want to use parameters of the upslope column for the Manning's roughness uh, and and for Darcy's law for the hydrologic conductivity. Um, and then uh, for beta zone processes, uh, I haven't gone into that too far, but most of the Earth system models already have a method set up to, to distribute vertical uh, soil moisture um, that we could use. Now preferential flow um, should also be thought of and included in the future. Um, finally, the groundwater and the river model would be coupled to <coughs> base flow in, in, in a regional model. The good thing about these two uh, methods for surface runoff and groundwater is that they're computationally very cheap um, and they could be computed at the same time step as the model. Um, finally, some other considerations uh, on this sort of approach is because of the heterogeneity of a hill slope, even within a grid cell there may be variations in geology in one mountain range versus another. So we may want to uh, have multiple hill slopes of this type in one grid cell or we may want to further parameterize the columns in, these, um, in this model to represent the heterogeneity in the different, different elevation bands. Also, of course, the biogeochemical processes, anthropogenic processes, and the atmospheric snowpack models need to be carefully coupled with such a model so that in each uh, in a column, there's a, a scaling of, of these processes and a, and a variation if it's required. Um, the good thing about spatially discretizing with columns is a lot of these models hard to use a column structure, plus they could also offer opportunities such as uh, uh, reservoirs or withdrawals from rivers at upper, upper, uh, mid, lap, mid altitude elevations that would affect uh, you know, decreasing the stream flow downstream. And then finally, the, uh, this method is just an idea, it's not tested. It would require quite a bit of work to, uh, to test it and set up a good experiment, but it would be uh, required in any case. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Any quick questions for John? So if you have a question, you can go ahead and either uh, raise your hand on your control panel or you can type it into the chat box and we will read it out loud. So I'm not seeing any hands raised yet or any questions, but I assume, okay. John, are you going to be on the line the whole time? Yeah. We can probably circle back, right, if someone thinks of something? Yes. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Is that whole online? Leho is here, so hi Leho. Hi, yeah, hi Ying, um, hi Emily. So long story short, I'm in Boise here with Jim. Um, it um, it involved a uh, it involved a kid having a concussion yesterday, but everything's oh, fine. No. So. Oh, oh, goodness. oh, I'm so sorry. Well, is he all right? Yeah. yeah, she's fine. She's fine. But so I de oh. I delayed my departure obviously for for a day to make sure everything was okay. So. Uh, uh -huh. Glad to hear that everything's okay. Yeah. 
All right, so we can we can So Leho. Yeah, I'll go ahead and give you screen sharing privileges. Okay. I just sent that over to you. Okay. And all right. And Great. so now I I accepted the invitation. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. We can. Okay. And then now I'm gonna and okay. So can everybody see that? Yep. Yes. Okay. So um so first off, thanks Ying um for oops sorry um for organizing this again um. And are you seeing my control panel for the GoToWebinar? Do I need to hide that? No, we're not seeing that. We're just okay. seeing your slide. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, so yeah, so thanks, Ying, for organizing this, um, this uh, seminar series. I think it's a really um, great opportunity to gather together folks that, um, you know, are, are sort of more traditionally hill slope scale hydrologists with the Earth System Modeling community. Um, and a lot of us have sort of you know, been thinking about how to how to sort of span that gap, and I think it's it's awesome to have an opportunity to have basically like a, a full sequence of events um, to think about how we might um, how we might sort of better connect these communities in an effort to improve the hydrologic um, and eco hydrologic representation in Earth system models. And so, um, so what what Jim and I have sort of put together here today is is not so much necessarily a intellectual framework for how to solve that sort of very difficult problem. Um, you know, we maybe have some ideas about that and are excited to sort of continue and engage um, in, in that, um, in that um, discussion and dialogue. Um, what we have today is, is just sort of a set of examples of, of why we advocate hill slope scale aspect slope and elevation as sort of key organizing factors or principles for which we have a lot of data globally, um, but also that you know um, exert significant control on and are controlled by um, you know hydrologic um, or water energy and nutrient cycles. And so we're going to lead you today through just a series of of, um, of observations and, and a number of different studies that have gone on here in our backyard. And and first of all, to sort of Pipe up and say, you know, we we understand and know very well that we are we are not the only people who have been thinking about um, the importance of of this work. And this is, you know, this is actually sort of a um, one of the themes that's emerged from the critical zone observatory networks, uh, particularly Boulder Creek, um, the folks at Hemez, and even some of the work that has gone on um, in, for instance, Shale Hills have have thought about slope and aspect as as important controls on critical zone processes and properties. And so um, I love to give this slide at the beginning of talks, particularly at places um, where the topography is a lot flatter than here in Idaho. Um, and so this is just sort of a, a tour up, you know, if you're driving to the local ski hill, which is about 45 minutes away, you would see these, these three images. Um, and so as sort of a, a process hydrologist, you know, you, you begin to make um, some key observations relatively quickly when you drive up this watershed just outside of town here. Um, and, and so when you do that, you sort of notice three things um, that we'll talk about at, you know, in a little bit more detail in which we've published a number of studies on. Um, and, um, and, and among those sort of key observations, right, is, is so you start to very quickly notice that there is important organization in things like hill slope steepness and geomorphology, um, in, in soil, soil characteristics, in the spatial distribution of vegetation communities, in the presence, absence of snow cover, and then the amount of snow and the duration of snow cover. Um, and you, you notice that there's a very strong organization or correlation with these variables and the hill slope scale. And so that very naturally leads us to a series of questions of, of how generalizable are these observations? Um, what is the what is sort of the impact? You know, if if these patterns are more generally applicable, um, you know, what is what are the ramifications on um, on watershed scale fluxes of water, energy, and and nutrients? And are there ramifications at the global scale? So um, the figure that Ying has. Um, that I, I gave to Ying that she's been graciously kind of showing to people before was 
um, kind of the, the start of a, a career proposal that I never submitted um, that was going to be focused on, you know, whether or not there was actually a hill slope scale um, signature on global climate. And I think that that's, you know, maybe an, a really interesting question to think about. Um, and, you know, what is that signature and, and does it matter? Um, so um, just to give you a, a sort of rundown of a few of these sort of, um, a few of these studies that we've, um, that we've done here at Boise State in collaboration with a lot of other folks. Um, so um, a, a, a really excellent student of, of Jen Pierce's um, that Jim and I had the opportunity to work with significantly um, by the name of Mike Poulos developed um, a relatively simple index for hill slope scale asymmetry in slope gradient um, that you could calculate from digital elevation models that are globally available. And so basically within sort of a, a window, so in this case a window that's five kilometers by five kilometers, um, you could look at um, the, the, the degree of steep, the, the degree of difference between the median slope on north aspects and the median slope of southern facing aspects and you could basically quantify this and turn it into an index that will show you contrasts in the landscape where hill slopes that are facing north are significantly different than hill slopes that are facing south. And you can map this anywhere you want to map it because of the proliferation of global digital elevation models. And, and Mike did that, um, you know, um, across a, a, a very large range of scales that that we'll show you here. So, and and across a, a range um, in which we notice sort of multiple scales of organization, um, where sort of hill slope scale patterns um, sort of differ. We look um, in a little bit broader uh, region in our backyard. We see that in fact um, the majority of places. Um, in the in the central Idaho mountains, we see that hill slopes on the north facing slopes are in fact steeper and significantly so than hill slopes on the south facing slopes. Um, but if you go up high enough in elevation, say if you cross about this 2,000 meter elevation contour in the Idaho Batholith, that sorry that relationship actually switches, and so south facing slopes wind up being steeper if you're above about 2,000 meters. Well, what's significant about that elevation, um, Mike posits that, and in, in a number of other studies have suggested this, that um, that change in elevation has to do with the, the extent of, um, of glaciation in, in the previous interglacial period. And so um, there are potentially important process mechanisms that underlie these observed trends in um, in hill slope scale asymmetry. Um, Mike actually sort of asked this question at a continental scale. So he took the entire con um, Western Cordillera um, and computed his hill slope scale asymmetry index and asked the question, is there a significant latitudinal variation um, as you go from pole to pole in hill slope scale asymmetry? And so clearly we see sort of local scale asymmetry that maybe caused by things like, for instance, glaciation um, or, you know, some other controls on, um, uh, on topography. But, you know, at, at this sort of global scale or hemispherical scale, we also sort of certainly see some important trends. So, for instance, between about, um, you know, so about somewhere between four, 50 degrees north and um, 10 degrees north, so in the, you know, in the extratropical boreal areas, um, we see, in fact, that on average, north-facing slopes are steeper and significantly so than south-facing south slopes. Now, it appears, um, on the other hand, that in the tropics, um, this relationship switches. Um, it seems to extend into sort of, um, you know, it, it extends further south. There's um, south-facing slopes are steeper from about 20 degrees south to 40 degrees south, but we sort of start to see the emergence of these hemispherical trends in the degree of slope steepness um, between north and south facing hill slopes. Um, so looking, you know, looking for instance at um, the distribution of, of snow cover, for instance, so that's a question about, you know, topography and steepness, which 
I tend to think sort of correlates with potential energy, right? And the the um, degree with which materials can sort of be moved down slope. So if we look and just do an empirical study um, on the presence or absence of, of snow cover, um, we see that topography at the hill slope scale again actually in, you know is a is a pretty good predictor of the presence or absence of snow cover. So this is was a student of mine, Reggie Walters, um, and he looked at you know so these three kind of subplot figures we have here. Um, so first of all, what's being shown here on um, I just want you to pay attention with um, these maps labeled um, FSL. So if we this is the the slope factor. So you can think of this as the amount of solar radiation that a 30 by 30 meter pixel uh, um, um, has on an annual basis relative to the corresponding pixel at the same latitude that is flat, right? So um, a, a higher slope factor, so a slope factor greater than one means that on average that location is receiving more solar radiation um, at the annual time scale than the corresponding pixel that is not that is flat um, at the same latitude um, and elevation. And so this indicates so south facing slopes in the northern hemisphere will have a slope factor that is greater than one, um, whereas north facing slopes will have a um, slope factor that is uh, less than one because they're facing away from the sun um, on average. And so if you look at these three um, so there's uh, three locations within an experimental watershed here um, in our backyard that, that Reggie looked at, and they have fractional snow-covered areas varying between 23 and 73 percent. So, you know, about 25 percent, 50 percent, 75 percent um, snow cover. And you see that um, if you look at the distribution of slope factors between all pixels within a one kilometer by one kilometer window, um, if you look at the distribution of, of snow cover, you see that those pixels that are snow covered are associated with slope factors that are very different in their distribution from um, those um, from all of the the um, hill slope scale fa facets within that one kilometer by one kilometer window. So, so what this sort of suggests to us is that um, those hill slopes that have lower insulation on average um, if you look at it at the scale of one kilometer, and Reggie looked at some other spatial scales as well, have significantly different um, patterns of snow cover than than um, all of the other pixels within within that sort of within that cell. So you can sort of start to think about, you know, okay, so what if this window size was say five kilometers by five kilometers or ten by ten, um, and start to imagine that you know there's some degree of persistence in um, Slope factor between um, you know between all of these um, um, all of these different sort of facets. So um, Jim McNamara um, had a PhD student, Pat Cormos, who has done a lot of uh, modeling work, and uh, Pat actually found pretty significant differences in um, the distribution of snow covered days. This was a modeling based study in a catchment within. The Dry Creek Experimental Watershed, and um, I'll let Jim really quickly kind of discuss the the results of this this study that Pat did. Well, the implications are pretty evident in the figure that on north facing slopes, in this particular site is in this rain snow transition zone, where above this elevation, the um, snow cover tends to be persistent. But in this very important transition zone, there are significant differences in how long snow lasts on a slope and how much snow is present in a given time. And, and in any given year, this could be all rain or all snow. And I just want to make the point that the aspect and elevation have very strong controls on the timing and magnitude of water input to the soils. Okay, so, um, and I, um, I'm really thinking I need to sort of move along more quickly, so I'll try to give you more of the sort of windshield tour, kind of speeding things up a little bit. So the upper left figure, we're not, we know that this is Idaho, we're not quite sure who this was. Um, the first time I saw this, I was still a PhD student at MIT, so I'm thinking maybe it was Valerie Ivanov or Erkan Istanbuloglu, but if it's you, please let us know and we'll properly credit you in the future with taking that picture. Um, so a student of mine actually um, asked the question, um, to what extent does topography only can, 
what, to what extent can topography serve as an important predictor of the spatial distribution of plant functional types within this watershed in our backyard? And so um, Ricky went out and she collected um, something on the order of 100 um, plot scale vegetation measures, so 30 by 30 plot vegetation plots where she characterized the distribution of vegetation at those plots within Dry Creek. Um, we came back and used some machine learning approaches to try and classify um, the spatial distribution of plant functional types based on topography only, reflectance only, and topography plus reflectance. And what you see is, in fact, um, that topography plays a um, very important um, role in being able to predict the, the actual distribution of plant functional types. And so, you know, the, the ramifications of this study suggest that at least that fractional um, plant functional type, um, well, suggests that at a minimum, when we think about um, what's, the, what's the fractional area within, for instance, a CLM pixel, um, that perhaps in these topographically complex regions that should be or could be at least tied to um, the, you know, the hill slope scale variation in, in those regions of the world. So, um, so we think as well that, you know, to hill slope scale topography um, is, is correlated with these um, spatial distribution of plant functional types, which clearly has ramifications for water, energy, and nutrient cycling um, at, at the land surface. So where uh, Leo showed some examples of hydrologic processes and properties that we can clearly see at the surface, and as Yang indicated in the beginning, like we know that the energy balance affects, uh, say, presence and absence of snow and vegetation. And I just want to give a couple quick examples of that there's more to the story uh, in the subsurface that impacts the hydrology, but is also truly a result of hydrologic processes operating at a long, uh, long term scale. So this is, these are uh, plots at eight different sites distributed across the elevation where we have pairs of directly north facing and south facing uh, soil moisture profiles. And what you'll see plotted is soil moisture storage at the various elevations. And lower in the elevation, there is significantly more water stored in hill slopes than south facing slopes. Uh, and that difference diminishes with elevation, but is significant at all except the highest elevations. Now, our initial assumption might be that that is purely a solar radiation driven. Soils are drier on the south slopes. That's part of the story. But also what we see is that on the lower left is a soil texture diagram where um, north facing slopes are, there are significant differences in the texture. North facing slopes are finer grained, which allow for more water holding capacity, which is directly influenced the storage. And also, the soils on the north facing slopes are significantly deeper. So deeper soils, finer soils, less solar radiation results in this significantly different soil water storage. And so our main point here is that there's lots of things at the surface and the subsurface that inter influence um, hydrologic response. This is just one more example in Dry Creek where a student, Mel Kunkel, mapped soil organic carbon, soil, yeah, soil organic carbon and demonstrated that uh, like soil moisture, that carbon is distributed. There's essentially more on the north facing slopes than the south facing slopes, and more at higher elevations than lower elevations. Um, okay, back to Leo. Yeah, so um, the final couple of slides we have here is that you know we also have some modeling um, based studies that are increasingly sort of showing um, ramifications of these. And, and so you know this is an example from one of my PhD students, Miguel Aguayo, who has used output from that we've run with a wharf model as input to the Parflow CLM model. So this is an older version of CLM, the community land model. Um, and just to sort of show you a nice GIF, um, you know, we see that there's sort of multi-scale organization going on in terms of, you know, what you're looking at the time evolution of snow water equivalent draped over the topography here. And you see that as time progresses, um, we start to see the emergence of these um, of these, you know, spatio-temporal patterns um, of hill slope scale aspect on snow water equivalent and correspondingly in soil moisture, which is not shown here, um, and in ways that sort of ultimately influence the runoff response simulated by this PAR flow model. So um, clearly we know that we can't run models like PAR flow, you know, at the global scale at 10 meter resolution within an earth system model um, but what we do know is that we have um, significant um, influence of 
hill slope scale topography on local water energy and nutrient cycles. So um, just to conclude here, um, you know, we, we think that we've at least demonstrated that there are significant correlations between that hill slope scale topography for which we have really outstanding global data sets and sort of local water energy and nutrient cycles. Um, and that hydrologic response is both controlled by and exerts control on topographic complexity. Um, and just earlier in the week, you know, so Praveen Kumar has been organizing a cross CZO modeling webinar, and he had this really great, um, really great um, sort of quip at the end that I don't, I don't think he realized sort of how good of a quote it was, but that um, over sufficiently long time scales, critical zone pro properties become critical zone processes. And so, um, again, here we're not pr proposing necessarily, although we have some ideas that are in our white paper, um, how exactly you, you model this within sort of a multi-column um, CLM type of approach, but what we are sort of arguing here is that, um, you know, there is a significant need to at least think about how hill slope scale aspect within a one kilometer by, or one degree by one degree um, spatial domain um, serves as a significant factor in controlling the cycling of water energy and nutrients and the redistribution of water energy and nutrients within the land surface. Um, and we believe or might hypothesize that, you know, there are, um, you know, that, that, that these potential influences of hill slope scale aspect um, and, and slope, you know, potentially scale up and exert um, influence at the, the regional or perhaps even global so, um, so yeah, so I'll just leave with this, you know, um, you know, so the, the question remains for us, I guess, and this is part of the dialogue here is, is how should this knowledge inform land models? Um, we have some ideas that, again, are, are in the, the white paper, um, but I think that this is, you know, this is something that um, we will sort of continue to grapple with over the coming, um, you know, years and decades as, as the computational um, the computational power increases and the data to sort of be able to parameterize these processes um, improves. And as we, you know, continue to have observatory networks such as the critical zone observatories um, that allow us to sort of think about, um, you know, what observations we should be collecting, what process studies we should be doing, what geophysical investigations we should be doing. So um, I guess more than anything, we're opening more questions than we are solving here, but um, we're just sort of here to sort of maybe advocate that um, the hill slope scale and you know slope aspect in particular deserves some important consideration in terms of how we might parameterize sub grid scale processes in models like CLM. Thank you so much, Leho. We're open to questions. So again, if you have a question, just go ahead and either type it in the questions box or you can press the raise hand button on your control panel and we will unmute you. Okay, it looks like questions are coming into the chat box. Just bear with me one moment here. So here's a question from David Goodrich. Have you looked into how well NRCS or global soils data reflects what you observed regarding textural differences as a function of aspect? Yeah, I, um, that's a good question, Dave. Um, and I, I think that the answer is, is that they, they don't at all, right? I mean, I think that that's, that's one of the sort of big limitations um, in, in sort of soil data sets even in the U.S., right, is that we don't really have, um, they're not sort of sufficiently resolved, um, you know, those kind of NRCS data sets, whether it's Sergo or Statsco, um, there's there's sort of less information there on sort of, you know, where where the data were collected, whether they're sort of, um, you know, 
collected on nor primarily north-facing slopes or south-facing slopes. Um, a lot of the sort of point scale samples from which they've collected that data um, are often not preserved in the in the in the data sets themselves. Um, and you know, to what extent they actually are sort of capturing hill slope scale or or, or you know sort of aspect influences on soil. Um, you can sort of see that in some of the maps that they produce, um, but it, it's really sort of all on a sort of surveyor by surveyor basis. And so I, I would say maybe that there's um, there's insufficient data to sort of um, answer answer your question sort of truthfully and fully, but it's sort of something that, that I think we sort of certainly need more effort and, and more sort of forethought on on that, so I don't know if Jim, you have any additional thoughts on that? Yeah, I just point that no, we did when we looked at the databases, uh, the textual descriptions on aspect are uh, not that different um, relative to what we observe. Okay, great. Here is another question from David Tarbotten. Both presenters mentioned a number of topographic indices from DEM. I'm curious as to whether there is anything missing in what we can compute from a DEM that may be helpful to this process and perhaps used in delineating the different areas that are modeled in an ESM. Dave, this is a this is Ying. Uh, Dave, this is a very very good question. Uh, we have been thinking about this, and uh, this question, the answer to this question, to a large extent depends on what we mean. Uh, how do we divide uh, a a ESM model grid into units? What are these units, right? Uh, if we're talking about um, hill slope characteristic hill slopes like what Peter and Zubin uh, presented, you have a convergent, divergent, and uh, um, uniform hill slopes. And do we have enough information to do that on the global scale? And if we use a Huris um, model, we have uh, those representative cross sections. Uh, how, do we, how do we do this? Do we have information? And what Huri did is to start with streams in both both actually Peter and Huri's model. Start with streams. Do we have high resolution first order stream uh, information? The elevation, particularly the elevation of the streams, a high resolution, and that's where the hill slope drains into. So do we have this kind of information? Uh, another example is the hand, the height above uh, nearest drainage. Do we do we have DEM at a sufficient resolution and stream network a sufficient resolution to derive to divide I'm sorry to derive uh, these different elevation bands. I don't know if I answer that question, but I think this is a really important question we need to ask. Okay, great. Um, here's a question for John from Mohammed Safiq. Says, how would you capture this aspect story, which I believe is fundamental for many hydrological processes at hill slope to catchment scale, in your hypsometry-based subgrid characterization? So, aspects uh, would have to be incorporated into uh, each column's surface area properties, and then. Uh, probably using some type of parameterization of contributing area of, of different aspects or having if, if a grid cell had <clears throat> you know some mountain ranges that are north south trending and some major ones the different direction you could potentially build a couple <clears throat> hill slopes uh, for that grid cell that have different aspects in the columns so that's just one thought, but yeah, there a lot a lot of work would need to be done to carefully incorporate uh, aspect into that model. So I don't know if that answered your question. Can I can I ask a question? Um, if there's no other comments coming, okay, I think there are more comments coming now. Jeff. 
I've just come from an AWRA conference at Snowbird on connectivity. It is clear that much of the community is focused on transient connectivity of hill slopes to streams, wetlands to stream, etc. How would the nonlinearities of threshold connectivity of landscape units, for example, hill slopes to streams, be accomplished in this approach? Leho and Jim, do you, do you want to give it a shot? Yeah, um, Ying, could you repeat the question? And that was, that was from Jeff? That was from Jeff, yeah. And I have just came from uh, the AWRA conference, Snowbird in Connectivity. It is clear that much of the community is focused on transient the connectivity of hill slopes to streams, wetlands to streams, etc. How would the nonlinearities of threshold connectivity of landscape units, for example, hill slopes to streams, be accomplished in this approach? Uh, the thresholds, not a continuous. Yeah, so um, I guess I, I backed up a, a slide here and, and sort of, so this was a figure that we again don't properly sort of credit. So this was Mike Poulos's like beautiful piece of art here on sort of uh, how aspect sort of influences critical zone, um, you know, critical zone architecture basically, um, at least from our perspective in our backyard here in, in, in Dry Creek and in the, in the Boise Front Mountains. And so certainly, you know, and, and Jim, I'm going to put him on the spot in a second here, but certainly, um, you know, connectivity is sort of something that we think has um, a, a pretty big, and it's something that, that a number of our students and a number of other works, particularly sort of working on some stable isotope work, have been trying to sort of sort out. But, you know, we think that certainly, you know, um, to, to the extent that we see influence of um, hydrologic influence of aspect on hydrologic response at the outlet of these watersheds, that that is sort of um, modulated by the influence of aspect on hydrologic connectivity. Um, and that occurs through a couple of different mechanisms um, that has to do with, you know, differences in soil texture, um, you know, and differences in, in soil depth. Um, but I think that that, from our perspective, um, I, I don't know that I'm necessarily answering the question directly, but we, we do think that connectivity is important and that actually like it, it correlates pretty well in, in some instances with um, aspect differences. So, um, so I'll, I'll let Jim sort of elaborate on, on that because he's thought a lot about connectivity. Yeah, so our work on the aspect control uh, has lots of implications for connectivity and runoff generation. Um, we haven't made that connection, but I know that uh, there's been some recent papers out of the Boulder Creek CZO from Suzanne Anderson's group that have taken that next step and has essentially documented that there are threshold differences. Because of all the properties and processes that we described, there are threshold differences in hydro response that are very closely tied to aspect. And so how to incorporate it, well, now you're asking a field guy to tell modelers what to do, but I'm a big fan of hydrologic response unit modeling. And in this case, if we can't directly physically parameterize the control, I would just say that aspect and perhaps the you know, probability distribution of aspect and elevation together is a very important property to incorporate into um, when you when we discretize into hydrologic response units. Leho uh, and a Jim, and I want to bring out a few points you. Um, you touched upon in your presentation that are critically important moving forward. Uh, one is the covariance of topography, uh, the aspect, uh, the elevation, and uh, with the other uh, non-topographic variables such as soil thickness, such as the soil texture, and then plant functional types. Uh, this is the kind of a patterns we have to really look for and to understand how these factors co-vary because we face a problem of dividing a model grid uh, into units, right? And uh, there is one way of dividing it by vegetation. There's another way of dividing it by aspect. There's another way of divide, uh, dividing it by uh, soil and uh, land cover uh, and the urban development infrastructure. So how 
how how do these conflict or agree with each other? We need to really think through this. So this is one point you brought up uh, that Sean Swenson had been asking uh, within the CLM group, how do we capture this co-variability? Uh, and they co-vary for very good reasons. There are trees in the valleys because the convergence, there's more water to support large vegetation. And in other places, trees on, on, on the uplands, like in, uh, in, the, in the inland, uh, in the uh, Amazon, when you have too much water, and uh, the lowlands has too much water and, and, and the oxygen stress, so large plants can't grow. And so wh what are these kind of patterns that we know of uh, across the globe, and how do they co-vary with vegetation, with topography and, and hydrology? I think this is really a critical question to ask. Uh, when we try to devise a way of breaking the grid into meaningful units. A second point you touched upon is uh, the, what CZOs are discovering. And we really need to make a meaningful connection with that community. And this, this synthesis project is really uh, designed to do so. But going forward, we need to have a two-way channel of flow of knowledge and information. And Suzanne's talk, uh, I heard a while ago about the Boulder Creek CGO revealed a huge amount of information that is the difference of the south and the north facing uh, slopes. The aspect that does not just manifest itself at the surface, but really deep all the way to the bedrock. And I said there's so many properties that are fundamentally different on north and south facing slopes. And so um, we also need to think of ways to communicate and to really um, steal or uh, distill the information, the knowledge that's gained from the CZOs. And uh, Jeff uh, was mentioning uh, uh, this disconnectivity of uh, plant water and the groundwater and the river water, this partitioning of green water and the blue water. What are the mechanisms of doing this, of, of, of this happening? And these are the things we, going forward we really need to ask ourselves. I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I think, Ying, just to follow up on that comment, um, so first off, thanks for, for, you know, kind of more eloquently saying what our sort of top level conclusion is maybe more than, um, you know, more than, than we were able to. But I think that that's absolutely right, right, that, that um, our perspective here, and right, this is the, I don't think that we have necessarily the, um, we don't know whether this, how generalizable this conclusion is, but that, that, um, you know, in some sense, you know, things are complicated. On the other hand, you know, from a sort of computational perspective, that aspect maybe gives you a lot of bang for the buck, right? So if, you, if you're considering variation and aspect in, in an ESM, you know, you potentially do get these kind of, um, you know, you do get these sort of structured patterns in soil properties and vegetation, um, you know, and so, so in some sense, aspect makes things complicated. On the other hand, you know, maybe from, if I put my sort of computational efficiency hat on, um, you know, potentially partitioning the landscape by aspect gives a lot of economy in terms of being able to, um, you know, do so efficiently because I can rest assured that, you know, my north facing aspects are, you know, I don't, I don't need a lot of pixels that, you know, I don't need a lot of columns that are, you know, um, North facing aspect and at least in in our narrow neck of the woods um, you know grass covered for instance, at least within a certain elevation band and so um, I, I guess that's you know you sort of eloquently identify that right is that there is this correlated structure um, and that that actually is maybe a, a vehicle to achieve better efficiency in partitioning the landscape so at the minimum, can we divide a grid into just four units, upland, lowland, sun facing, and shade facing. Can we achieve a lot by doing that? Can we capture some of the fundamental differences within a model grid? Okay, so there are some other questions. Comment from Steve Burgess, need to include civil infrastructure into each grid cell. With the reservoirs, the issue will be flow routing. Anyone wants to come um, to answer that?
Yeah, I I, um, I wholeheartedly agree, Steve. I think um, that's that's a you know so that was what my other career proposal was sort of focused on, which which you know was fortunately successful. Is is the extent to which humans are actually altering the um, you know the flow of of again water, energy, and nutrients um, in these watersheds, and that's something that is you know I think I think is caught um, you know captured a little bit in terms of irrigation. Um, I believe, and and also just uh, from the biogeochemical side in terms of harvest, right? Um, you know, of of woody material, um, you know, is sort of I impacting the carbon cycle. But something that is, you know, the the water management aspects, and you know, that irrigation, for instance, you know, not being not being connected with, for instance, the discharge um, and the influence of reservoirs in sort of storing snowpack um, runoff. Um, is something that that is certainly kind of not captured, um, and the influence of of I mean, it it rapidly gets complicated, right? Because then you need to represent the behavior of the people that are turning the knobs, um, and and that is in and of itself a very complex and interesting question, and maybe the topic for a whole different um, Inspire grant um, that that maybe needs to be thought about. I believe Dave Lawrence is online, and he is the co-lead of CLM um, working group. And I believe CLM had already incorporated some of the human um, influences, right? Well, at least I know Zubi, uh, I mean, uh, Ruby Leon's group is doing groundwater pumping, irrigation, and all these uh, human interference into. Dave, I unmuted you if you if you yeah. uh, would like to speak. Yeah, if you can hear me, yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, Leah is exactly right. We have some of these processes represented irrigation, uh, some agricultural management, but reservoirs is not currently um, managed. So you know we don't have uh, properly a good way to sort of source where the irrigated water comes from. Um, so we kind of we kind of just take it from the ocean <laughs> when we need it. Uh, so, which is obviously not correct, but it's it's the, what we're doing now. And there is recognition across the or system on community that, that this is something that needs to happen. There have been some meetings; people starting to talk about it. But because of the complexities of reservoir management, it adds a layer that so far hasn't really not very commonly addressed. And as Leho said, maybe that requires another inspire. And this one is really focusing on hill slope hydrology. Thank you, Dave. And I want to read the next comment from David Goodrich. Uh, um, as resolution of DEMs improves, as well as above ground characterization of land use and land cover improve with higher resolution sensors, it appears that estimating soil hydraulic properties and their associated parameters is becoming an even more critical challenge for the community. Has anyone seen any breakthrough on this front? So you mean, Dave, as we have more and more data available, are we, are we using the data actually to estimate soil hydraulic properties? Uh, to constrain those models. Hello, you have it. Sorry. Yeah, this is Jim. I'm just so I'm seeing a comment from Martin Clark about uh, maybe we shouldn't focus on de desegregation rules of properties, but focus on processes. And I wholeheartedly agree, but would also say that it's the landscape processes that largely control the processes. And so I don't think we can <laughs> separate the two. Where yeah. where is I don't see Martin's I don't see Martin's um comment, is it? Oh, it says I'll read it then, unless okay. Martin wants to. I guess since I got the phone. I'm not sure if we should be searching for globally constant disaggregation rules, e.g. a quadrant of elevation and aspect. Rather we should be looking for the dominance of different processes in different environments and use this knowledge to define the different hill slopes in each grid 
So. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Which which we, we, we try to uh, address in the first webinar is where in the world, uh, you know, these hill slopes are important, uh, and yeah. through what processes, right? That really uh, served as the as the starting point, and then and would, once we, yeah. Well, I'm just saying that I just don't think that we can talk about one or the other. We can't talk about process processes without properties. They're they're tightly linked. Right. Right. They're in right. the same equation. Processes, properties are K. Processes are the gradient. We want to reduce it to Darcy's law. Right. Any more comments, questions, for the speakers, and then just general ideas, and going forward, any suggestions? What are the minimal things we can do? And what are the essential global analysis that we must do in order to know what's next step? Do we have enough information to support some basic implementation of whole slope hydrology in CLM? Um, Leho and Jim's white paper described a, a, a very simple approach. Upland, lowland, upland, midland, lowland, and north facing and south facing. Basically, you have uh, four or six columns to start with. Any comments? Yeah, I, um, I would just to sort of follow up on that, Ying, you know, so what, what I sort of proposed in the white paper, right, for instance, was just a, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of these kind of like end member sensitivity analyses, right? And so, um, so it may very well be, right, that so, so you know, my, um, the sort of proposed numerical experiment, right, is to sort of do that, um, do that experiment where you have, you know, kind of three, you know, three connected north facing and three connected south facing upland, midland, lowland columns, um, and just run CLM for a set of experiments and compare that with what Justin has sort of already shown, right? And I think that he did a good job at at demonstrating sort of the progress he had made at the um, at the the lunchtime meeting we had at AGU, right? And, and just sort of showing what is the what is the what is the difference. The, what difference does it make um, in terms of, you know, soil moisture, snow water equivalent, um, and, you know, runoff generation at the global scale, um, you know, w when you represent, when you represent the landscape that way, I mean, does it, does it make a big difference? Maybe it doesn't make a big difference. Um, and so I think that's a, you know, that, that's maybe a relatively quick, Simple numerical experiment that can be done um, that might be revealing, right? Might be revealing in that no, it doesn't make a big difference. Maybe, you know, maybe the role of hill slopes and um, aspects washes out at that spatial scale. Um, I suspect that in in some regions of the world, it's going to matter. I mean, this is getting to sort of Martin's point. In some regions, yes, it 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 will matter. In other regions, no, it it won't really matter. Um, so, so yeah, I mean th that. The set of experiments I think we proposed was as much to identify where in the world might this be worth thinking about in in more detail, and which parts of the world does some other kind of subgrid scale parameterization make more sense? Yes, fully agreed, and that is in the plan actually. I hope uh, next set of experiments, Justin will be doing is to. Uh, now run the run the four columns. Uh, one is south facing, one is sun facing, one is shade facing. So that's in the plan. And so um, the sensitivity uh, is is the question. And and uh, that is in the plan. But going beyond that, we still need to uh, tackle the whole world. And so a lot of the questions we have to uh, address is you know for example how do we divide them into columns? We're, using elevation as, as John proposed, we're using hill slopes as Peter and Zubin proposed, we're using uh, elevation bands starting from streams and like uh, like Tori proposed. And so uh, we, we going 
right now we, we know some sensitivities we can do, uh, but going forward we still have to ponder this question, how do we do the globe meaningfully? And there are a whole bunch of questions now. Okay, uh, from, from Mohammed uh, Shafiq, uh, we may not be able to capture all the properties and the processes for a variety of reasons. Identifying dominant processes properties through model experiment may help us move forward. Fully agreed. Uh, next one, did anyone look at the percent split between overland flow versus base flow in these hill slope studies? This will reflect the sensitivity of various processes and the properties. If the question is about the, the dry creek uh, things are showing, we essentially don't have any overland flow except in the extreme situations. So we haven't just because overland flow is not an important process here. But we, the, it does mostly affect the subsurface connectivity, um, is, uh, at least in our backyard, where that becomes important. Okay, not, next question uh, from, from Charlie Luce. To what extent does the probability distributed principle from a form a way to frame using multiple dimensions of control on hydrology? For example, elevation aspect, bedrock, vegetation, downslope distance, climate broadly. Does connectivity of each piece need to be explicitly mapped or derived as an emergent property? Very good question. Anyone wants to give it a try? Maybe Charlie, you can. Um, sorry. Sorry, I didn't quite hear hear the last part of that question. Does the negativity of each piece need to be explicitly mapped or derived as an emergent property? Maybe we should uh, um, let Charlie. Let me unmute Charlie to. Um, tell us more what's on his mind. Charlie, you're unmuted. Okay. <clears throat> Can you hear well enough? Yes. That's right. Great. So I was just reflecting on uh, Moore's article from 85, the probability distributed where you can have some computational savings. But it looks like there's a lot of people with different ideas of different controls on the fundamental hydrology, uh, which may change from place to place, but you could build a framework to include the, the biggest pieces of those. The trouble with that one or the complexity in that approach is explicit connectivity being mapped on the landscape versus each place just operating independently, either the, the non the not cascading down the hill slope thing. But it's possible that some of those broader controls could also form emergent rules about the connectivity, as Jeff was pointing out. So you you are um, you are talking about the in the 80s and 90s, there's a flurry of statistical dynamical approach to represent subgrid variability, where you have distribution, you have a joint distribution, but the patches do not have any relationship with each other. And then, right. but the statistical properties and the variability is captured, but no connectivity. So you're saying we may be able to actually uh, bring in connectivity as well. Right, and pay attention to covariance, which I don't think was often applied in the 80s and 90s, but with more remote sensing capacity and more detailed data, we can bring the covariance aspect of the landscape organization into play. I think the hard piece is still the, the arrangement of these things in the landscape to provide some measure of connectivity. Right, what really bothered me with this statistical dynamical approach is that uh, as if the heterogeneity across the landscape are not related to each other, as, as if they're just random patches. And the connectivity is really important. The topography gives us, us a heterogeneity that's not random, that's highly structured. The valleys connect with each other. Small streams drain into big streams. Ridges flow into valleys. 
these structures are not represented in those statistical dynamical probability distribution approaches. So that always bothered me. Maybe I'm the only one who's bothered. <laughs> I think uh, this is Jim again. I, I think Charlie brings up at least a, a couple of important points, and a, a key word is emergent properties, and in particular connectivity. Because we think about kind of the older school lumped parameter approaches, and even the HRU approaches that focus on uh, properties, lumping landscapes by properties that we do think control um, hydroelectric response. If we think about how do those properties uh, come together to produce, and this is getting maybe to Martin's point, processes that are important, and we look at the, say, the runoff generation literature, the constant theme is that what's important is connectivity uh, and thresholds. And so, you know, those properties come together to uh, produce those emergent properties, and maybe if we rethink the the lumped parameter or HRU approach to focus on those emergent properties as a way to bring together that that process property problem. Right, and something I thought I remember from the Dry Creek asked was just even contributing area differences between north and south facing slopes. That's right. That's all. That's come out of Mike Poulos's dissertation where he. Um, Soon to be published, as soon as we overcome uh, maybe one of your uh, reviewers, not you, Charlie, in general. we got some challenging reviews to deal with on that one. <laughs> Thank you, whoever that was. Any more comments, questions? Uh, I would just like to say a little thing on that connectivity down uh, hill slope. Um, <clears throat> in I'm doing a little work in the Great Basin, some Great Basin mountain ranges uh, modeling work, and some of the, the times where lateral flow through inner flow through soil soils and preferential flow are particularly important for mid altitude portions of the hill slope are, are years where the soil moisture in the mid and low elevation zones is pretty high in the uh, uh, for, uh, storage from uh, from a wet year and other times when there's large you know amount of rain or or something to kind of fill up the storage so if we have a column based approach and downslope columns have a, a certain you know threshold storage um, in the previous you know time step or whatever that could be a factor determining the um, the connectivity and conductivity for, of soil interflow uh, downslope that's all So that I just just made me think of that all the all of this conversation. So okay, um, so we are we have passed uh, four o'clock, and uh, um, there's a lot of ideas. <laughs> and uh, can we maybe perhaps uh, agree on um, that some of the most basic stuff that we can do uh, that can be immediately uh, done, uh, such as um, this experiment that Laho suggested, the sensitivity experiment. Uh, Justin has done the Hills Global Convergence Sensitivity Experiment. And uh, next uh, in the plan is the slope aspect sensitivity experiment and the four columns now will have another four columns that is south or north facing and draining into the same streams. Uh, so going next step going forward is to take this to the globe. And so we're going to continue this discussion next seminar. Next seminar is uh, specifically asking this question, how do we take this uh, to the globe? We have the sensitivity analysis we show that these, this, the convergence and the aspects are important in a high relief terrain with a dry season, such as in the Reynolds Creek. And going now outside of Reynolds Creek and, and looking at the very diverse uh, global hydrologic uh, processes and environments, uh, what should we do? And so we're going to have two talks next week, um, taking this to the globe and from Nate uh, and uh, and uh, uh, John, and who have done a lot of work in this area. And so uh, if you have no more comments, questions, we can end here. And meanwhile, 
uh, send your comments by email to me or to the whole group and we'll compile these ideas into the final synthesis paper. And for those of you who have not been on the mailing list yet and would like to really uh, be part of this conversation going forward, please send me an email and I will include you uh, in future communications. Thank you everyone, thank you for the speakers. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, Yang. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Yang. Thank you. I am. Um, yep. Okay, so you can you can um, turn off. You can terminate. I I will. I will. Thank and you. while Bye, while everyone. people are getting off the line, I just want to make an announcement that Quasi just opened registration for the 2017 conference on hydroinformatics. So if that's something you're interested in, I'm just putting the link into the chat box. All right. All right. Have a good weekend, everyone. Yep, you too. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everyone.